I recently did a week-long camping trip that let me use both my do-it-yourself power station and the lithium iron phosphate battery setup I installed in my 26-year-old pop-up camper. It was a good opportunity to compare them, see how they performed, and look for some needed improvements. Stick around and I'll tell you how it went and what I learned from it. Hi, I'm Gary. I'm a retired electrical engineer who makes videos about technology subjects that happen to interest me. Nothing theoretical, just stuff I actually want to use. If you followed this channel, you may know that I completely upgraded the power system in my old pop-up camper last fall with a lithium iron phosphate battery, an inverter, a solar controller, and some other convenience features. And several months ago, I also built a do-it-yourself portable power system for car camping that's designed to power my 12-volt fridge for several days. But I hadn't actually made use of either of these projects because I live in Idaho and I don't like camping in cold weather. It's just not my thing. It's finally showing signs of spring in the mountain states. So last week I took the pop-up camper, put my DIY power station in the fridge in the car, and headed for Colorado National Monument for the week with one of my grandsons. And by the way, that's a fabulous place for camping that I had never even heard of until a month ago. I'll definitely be going back there. The scenery was great, the campground was excellent, and the weather was mostly sunny with highs around 70 and lows in the high 40s. However, if you do decide to go there, you should know that the campground sites are too small and unlevel for big RVs, and there are no hookups. At any rate, this gave me the chance to actually use all this neat power stuff that I spent so much time building. My earlier series of videos on the trials and tribulations of powering my 12-volt fridge resulted in a conclusion, and a lot of comments, that my power stations were too small, which was true, and that I also needed much bigger solar panels. Not necessarily true, as it turns out. Everybody's power needs and druthers will be different, so I need to put this in context by telling you specifically what we did. As I said, the 12-volt fridge was mostly in the car, powered by my DIY power station. I charged it before we left home, and the only recharging its 100-amp-hour battery received during the trip came from a 50-watt Renergy flexible solar panel on the roof. The pop-up camper also has a 100-amp-hour lithium battery, which was charged before we left, and recharged while we were in the campground with a 100-watt all-powers flexible solar panel that was bungee-corded to the roof of the camper. The camper also has a very small refrigerator that operates solely on propane. So our electrical power usage for the camper itself was lights in the evening and running the furnace to warm up in the mornings. But we had two laptops, two phones, a tablet, and a music player to keep charged, and we used them a lot in both the car and the camper. I did bring along my small Wee Town power station so my grandson could run his laptop on the 500-mile drive from Idaho to Colorado, and it got some recharging from a USB-C power adapter in the car. At this point, you may well be wondering why a week-long camping trip needed two refrigerators and three battery power sources. Well, to be honest, it didn't. But I didn't know that in advance, so I guess I was being overprepared in case of unanticipated problems. The camper fridge does tend to freeze everything overnight, so the stuff that shouldn't freeze went in the 12-volt fridge, which was in the car, so that it was accessible during the trip. It was set to around 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and I intended to move it inside the camper once we got settled. Two power stations in the car were obviously overkill, but that was partly because of some limitations that I'll bring up later. This trip was not conceived as a field test. I just wanted to go camping. It was only after we left that I realized this was my first real test of all this gear, and I probably should follow up my fabrication videos with some actual use information. So how did it all work? In a word, it worked perfectly.
We used all the power we wanted for whatever. My grandson had his laptop and or his music player going hours every day, working on music arranging. And the cellular service was good enough that I could use my phone as a Wi-Fi hotspot for internet access. We never once had to give any thought to whether we had enough power or not. However, I did find a couple of things that could stand improvement. As I said, I intended to move the 12-volt fridge inside the camper while we were stationary in the campground, so it'd be more convenient for fixing meals. But then I realized that I had never installed the 12-volt power outlet that would let me plug in the fridge. And I didn't really want to run it off the inverter for efficiency reasons. So we made a side trip to Harbor Freight to get some parts, and I installed a temporary 12-volt outlet wired directly to the battery. A bit clunky, but it worked, and the fridge ran fine from the camper battery for two or three days. The other minor deficiency I realized during the trip is that my DIY power station has no provision for recharging from a 12-volt source, like the car. This would be handy for an extended trip in case of lots of cloudy weather, or so I could park the car in the shade to keep temperatures down. This would require DC to DC conversion of some sort because a car's 12-volt electrical system isn't designed to charge a lithium iron phosphate battery directly. The voltage curves just don't match well enough. The Weetown power station illustrated how useful this could be because it will accept up to 60 watts of charging input from a USB-C power delivery source. That meant my grandson could run his laptop full-time on the inverter while we were driving without running down either the power station or the laptop battery. So that's a possible upgrade for my do-it-yourself power station. Now, if this seems like a lot of talk just to tell you that everything worked fine, you're right. I didn't plan the trip as a test, so I didn't have any measurement equipment to quantify the results. The one exception is that the Victron solar charge controller in the camper does record solar charge energy coming in. Here's a graph of what it recorded during the five days we were stationary in the Monument campground. The camper was in the sun all day, because there weren't any useful trees at our site, and the weather was pretty consistently sunny until the end of the trip, when it kind of turned on us. So you may wonder why the numbers are so different for the five days. I think this graph of the actual charging time explains two reasons for that. We didn't get set up until after lunch on Sunday, so the amount of charging time on the first day was much less that day. And we didn't use as much power the first couple of days, so the controller was in float mode much of the time. The battery was staying fully charged and just not accepting much charge energy. When our usage went up later, the bulk portion of the recharge was a good bit larger. For those of you who may not be familiar with multi-mode charging, bulk mode is essentially maximum charge current to put as much energy as possible into the battery. Then the controller switches to a constant voltage absorption mode to finish the charge, after which it reduces the voltage slightly to keep from overcharging. Little or no charging happens in this float mode. So even though I didn't have any measurements of the energy we actually used, the charge time graph shows that the battery was fully recharged every day after the first one. The controller also recorded the maximum power from the solar panel each day, which ranged from 77 watts to a pretty amazing 110 watts on Monday. The panel's only rated for 100 watts. What this demonstrates is that a seven-day trip, two days of driving and five days of camping, is no problem with my setup as long as there is sunshine. But what if there isn't? After we returned home, I did some more testing to try to evaluate that possibility. I left the car sitting in my driveway, in the sun, for several more days with the fridge still running from the DIY power station and the 50-watt solar panel connected to it. Connecting a power meter to both the input and output of the power station let me measure both the fridge energy consumption and the daily amount of solar recharging. 
I kept some beverages in the fridge and opened it several times a day to get one out, to give some simulation of use. So here are the daily charging watt hour totals for four days. If you add those up, the grand total of charging energy from the 50 watt solar panel was 917 watt hours, while the fridge used a total of 939 watt hours over that same period. I draw two conclusions from these numbers. One, my little 50 watt solar panel came very close to keeping up with the fridge energy usage. The fridge was running in eco mode, by the way. And two, the fridge total energy consumption was only about 75% of the battery rated capacity. So solar wasn't really even needed for that length of time. That validates my design for the power station because that's exactly what I wanted it to do. There was one more thing that seemed worth knowing when I returned from the trip. How much energy was left in my power sources? So I discharged them all at 6 to 8 amperes, which is roughly the maximum current I used at any time during the trip. The camper battery delivered 1112 watt hours, which is about 87% of its rated capacity. The little Wee Town power station still had 269 watt hours of its nominal 300 left, while the do it yourself power station gave up 1154 watt hours, 90% of rated, and that's after an additional four days of running the fridge. All in all, I'm calling both the camper power upgrade and the DIY power station a success for my purposes. And in fact, we could easily have done the trip with only one of them. As I said earlier, your power needs will be different. You may want bigger solar panels, and if you're running high demand loads, you might even need more energy storage. But I'm confident now that the two or three day trips I'm prone to making will be no problem even if the sun doesn't cooperate, which was definitely an issue with the smaller power stations I tried earlier. If you happen to be interested in the history of this experiment, there are links to the earlier videos I made in the description of this one. There are three about the 12 volt fridge, one on the DIY power station, and two on the camper power upgrade. Looking at the list suggests to me that I have probably overworked my camping power problem. But hey, what else would you do in Idaho in the wintertime if you don't ski? I'm kidding, it's really nothing like that. But now summer's coming again, and I can plan to reap the benefits of these projects. If you enjoyed any of this, or even learned something interesting, please consider leaving a like or subscribing to the channel. I'll go on doing this because it's fun, but it's always nice to know that other people are interested. And as always, thank you very much for watching.